The following program is recorded content created by the Truth Network. It's Matt Slick Live. Matt is the founder and president of the Christian Apologetics Research Ministry, found online at CARM.org. When you have questions about Bible doctrines, turn to Matt Slick Live for answers. Taking your calls and responding to your questions at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome to the show. It's me, Matt Slick. You're listening to Matt Slick Live. If you want, you can give me a call at 877-20-72276. And if you're new to the show, Matt Slick is my real name. It really is. And it uh, works per- perfect for radio. And we do uh, Christian apologetics. We answer difficult questions on the faith, on Christianity, on uh, cults, world religions, how to prove God exists, women pastors and elders, baptism. All kinds of stuff. There's lots of questions to be had, and hopefully we can get in and do some answering and some questions. If you've got one, all you got to do is call 877-207-2276. But if you want to, you can email me at info at carm.org, info at carm.org. And um, you can just put in the subject line, uh, let's see, it would be a, carm, uh, a radio question or radio comment at any either one of those. And I often read them on the air and, and uh, try and answer them and address them. So there's that. Uh, let's see. Okay, i got a couple things to announce. We've got a uh, caller coming, but uh, we are still involved in going to Israel, uh, not Israel, next year in April, we're going to be doing the Footsteps of Paul tour. And it's it's expensive. It's, it's not cheap. But we're going to be going to, for 19 days, we're going to be going to Turkey and visit each location of the, uh, the churches of Revelation, and then we're going to also go to Ephesus, which I've been there before. And oh my goodness, it is it's, a, it's wonderful to see. It, it's it's just it's incredible. And then we're going to go to Greece and uh, see Athens and see some other stuff in Greece. Then we're going to go to Italy and uh, do uh, footsteps of Paul in Rome. And so that's going to be great. If you are interested, just check it out. You can email me if you want. Uh, info at karm.org and say, hey, where's the, uh, the you know the URL for that and all that stuff. That's one thing. And to, let's see, so Sunday I'll be preaching down in uh, Provo. Um, and uh, there's a, at the church, a city on a hill. And if you go to karm.org forward slash calendar, C-A-R-M dot O-R-G forward slash calendar, then... Um, uh, you can see where I'll be preaching there is the address and the whole bit. The church starts at 11 o'clock. I'll be preaching on on the spiritual warfare, the occult, and things like that. And I'll be talking, uh, telling stories of my involvement with the occult when I was younger. There's that. And the uh, the uh, Bridge Paul Tour is the name of the tour we're going on. So if you want to check it out, Bridge, B-R-I-D-G-E, you know, all one word, Bridge Paul Tour. And uh, you can check that out. And CD on a Hill, I'll give more information. I'll get it too much right away. But you can always email me and hey, hey, what about the the tour and what about the preaching? If you want to combine, listen. Um, don't know what our schedule is going to be. It might even be, um, uh, you know, go to a restaurant on a Saturday night or something like that and just have people meet us there because because the show's down there and uh, in Salt Lake and sometimes people like to just kind of you know uh, meet the, the the radio guy. We'll see. All right. So having said that, why don't we? Give the phone number out one more time, 877-207-2276. Let's get on the air with Alan from Virginia. Alan, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. Thank you. How are you today? I'm doing okay. Hanging in there, man. Hanging in there. What do you got? Uh, All right. So before I get started, is it okay if I ask some setup questions? Sure. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. So, like you sometimes say, let's define our terms, and the term I'm wanting to define first, or define here, the only one, is all-knowing. So, I think it's a pretty, I think my definition for all-knowing is the state and not the action of knowing everything. Would you agree? How about this? I'll modify it. Everything actual as well as potential. How about that? Okay. 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 All right. All right. Um, so, do you agree that there is scripture that points to God being all-knowing, such as Psalm one forty-seven, verse five? 
Yes. And the first John three verse yes. twenty. That's right, first John three twenty. Okay. He knows all things, yeah. Uh huh. All right. And because of this, all three persons of the one God, God the Father, God the Son, slash the Word, and the Holy Spirit are all knowing, correct? Yes. Okay. And since all three persons of God were the beginning, they were always all knowing, right? Correct. What church do you go to, by the way? I know where you're going, but keep going. What church do you go to? Okay. Or, or you're an atheist? Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an atheist, no. Um, there you go. I used I, I was going for I was going to Clover Hill Baptist for a little bit. So, uh, but, so you're um, Christian right. now? You're Christian or what? Yeah. Yes. So okay. so don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not I'm not denying that God is all knowing or anything like okay. that. Okay. Just think. Right? This is one of arguments to... I know from atheists. That's okay. But keep going. Sorry. Just checking. Okay. Yeah. No worries. Um. So we got all three persons of God were the beginning, and they were always all knowing. Since Jesus has two natures, divine and human, and the Father and the Holy Spirit only have one, which is divine, does this mean that the all-knowing of God is part of his divine nature through process of elimination? Yeah, so it, it automatically is part of his divine nature. It's necessarily part of, uh, it's a necessary um, property of God, all-knowing, okay? Okay. So, since it is a part of God's divine nature, then that means when Jesus was in the womb of Mary, he was all-knowing, right? We don't know. And there, see, this is where we get into, uh, we, we just don't know things. We don't know uh, to what extent the attributes of both natures being ascribed to the single person were working in that situation. We know that the divine nature has to have all knowledge, and it can't not. So when it's in the womb in union with the, with the the human we don't know what relationship that was we don't know if there was a a characteristic of humanity in which the full cogniz cognition wasn't uh communicated to the person which was under development i mean this gets really complicated we just don't know it would on, on a base level we could say well yeah nature you know he knows all things so to what extent did he know when when it was a, it was a zygote you know, fertilized egg and we just can't answer we just don't know did god cooperate with limitations did he just not access that access that that ability uh, but that would that, you know, there's some ifs and not so good ramifications of that you see it's a tough one okay Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll share my belief. I believe that from the instant Jesus was formed, since he has both natures, since the all-knowing is attached to his divine nature, then he was always all-knowing. Yes. That's but my belief of it. Luke, 5, two, Luke 2.52, he grew, kept uh, growing in wisdom and stature. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to that too, yep. Mm -hmm. but so in Luke two fifty two, how can he grow in wisdom if he has all knowledge? Because with all knowledge, and there's a, that's called omniscience, but omnisapience is all wisdom. So mm -hmm. he has that; that's part of his nature. So how can he grow in wisdom? So yeah, so so there's that, and there was also Luke two forty, which in the NASB ninety five it talks it talks about increasing a wisdom, mm -hmm. but in different versions it talks about being filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Let me look at the uh, comparisons. ESV, filled with wisdom, uh, filled with wisdom, strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. So let me look at the Greek, uh, increasing. Oh, it's from uh, pleroma, which means to fill, or plerao, and uh, so being filled with wisdom. Interesting. So I could see why someone might say filled with the, wis with the Holy Spirit in wisdom, but it doesn't say that. I wouldn't add it in there. But being filled in wisdom, increasing in wisdom, which would come from God, yep, uh huh, no problem. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, so one of the things where I have a hard time, I have a hard time entertaining the camp of he wasn't all knowing is to then that denies that he. Well, I'm wording this wrong. If I if I'm in, I have a hard time going into the camp of believing that there's a chance he did not he was not all knowing just because that would then deny that God's all knowing and I feel like that's a heresy. Correct. 
Now, let me, so, let's stop here for a second and talk about a doctrine called the communicatio idiomatum. And then there's another doctrine called inseparable operations. So look, let's go over them. So the communicatio idiomatum okay. is the, the teaching that in the one person of Christ are two natures, the divine and human, that's called the hypostatic union, but that the attributes of both natures are ascribed to the single person. Jesus says, I'm thirsty, human nature, I'll be with you always, divine nature. So the same person, I, said both. So the attributes are attributed to the one person. All right, that's called the communication of the properties, which is important because when Jesus died on the cross, only the human nature died. How is a sacrifice of divine value? Because the representation of the death on the cross was by the, the person of Christ, who has the quality mm -hmm. of divine attributes as well. All right, so there's a, the doctrine called inseparable operations is kind of related to perichoresis. And perichoresis in the <laughs> in the doctrine of the divine simplicity, I'm blowing people's brains out probably with this, all this stuff, divine simplicity simply says that God is uh, one simple substance, the divine substance. Perichoresis says that the three persons of the Godhead are interdwelling each other. So what we would say, the perichoretic relationship in divine simplicity is a shorthand term for saying all of that. All right, there's a doctrine called the um, inseparable operations. And what that is, is the position that all the members of the Godhead are involved with everything that each one does. And yet there's distinction, because before the foundation of the world, they were in a perichoretic existence and is a divinely simple being, so that the Father elected in the Son, who is existing uh, in Christ, and the Holy Spirit is there uh, mediating and working and will apply the redemptive work in the future. Jesus on earth said, I can only do what I see the Father do, present tense. Whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner, present tense. So what Jesus is, is saying there is that he sees what the Father is doing and the Father is doing what he's doing. So this is called inseparable operations, that the operations of the members of the Trinity are not separable. Yet there's distinction. This gets really tough, but this is the nature of God that we're talking about. Now these are not contradictions, but they are paradoxical, and uh, not, mm -hmm. not antinomies either. And, and, and people don't think to look up that word, antinomy. A-N-T, antinomy. But uh, so, having said all of that, now when we come to the person of Christ, he grew in wisdom and stature. Well, stature we get. How can he grow in wisdom? Could it be that what Luke was saying was that before people, he was growing in wisdom, but he had all the wisdom and it was manifesting uh, at different times. And so it, to them, it was appearing to grow as, as he was growing in wisdom. That's one possibility. The other one is that there's a relationship between the divine and human nature in this as being under the law, and that he would study the word and learn accordingly. But how's that possible if he has, he's the author of the word. You see, so we have a mystery here, <laughs> and it's a tough one. And it is, it's a tough one to, uh, to fathom and to work through. And what I did was give a bunch of information that's supposed to clarify it, but really doesn't. It just adds to the problem. So hold on, we got a break. Hold on, buddy. Hey, folks, we'll be right okay. back after these messages. Please stay tuned. We'll be right back. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. All right, everybody, welcome back to the show. Let's get back on there with Alan. Alan, I gave you a lot of information. There's even more we could talk about, but your turn. All right. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, the theories and explanations so far, Matt. Okay. There's one other thing um, I didn't mention, though. Okay. And that was he was under the law. And Galatians 4.4, 4, and then Hebrews 2.9 says he was made for a little while earlier than the angels. So we throw all that in with the Trinity divine simplicity, the uh, perichoresis, inseparable operations, 
incarnation and the nature of the law all mixed together and we have a complicated kind of a maze to kind of work through. So what I like to say is, is in light of all of this that I don't know what the text actually means and if it means that he literally was growing in wisdom then it can only mean that there was a cooperation with the limitation of the divine nature uh, somehow uh, and or he didn't access or choose to access the information because there's a concept in the Bible where God says he will remember your sins no more that's not the same thing as forgetting forgetting is something that happens to us remembering is something we choose to do I will remember how you you wronged me last week I'll, I'll bring it up I'll remember it so when God remembers it no more it means he doesn't bring it up so perhaps there's something to say that Jesus was not remembering everything in that he had access but didn't choose to now, I'm not saying this is true there are just logical possibilities and there's strengths and weaknesses to all of them and what does it mean to be made under the law because he's obligated to have someone he would call God and so you call the Father God my God and your God well how's that possible if he's divine so these kinds of questions all relate to the difficulty of the incarnation and the and all these big words I said combined and what it all means and theologians have wrestled with it for a long time and I certainly haven't figured it out so okay okay um before I go could I could I ask could I um tell you one thing though sure um so one thing I noticed I'm going through your podcast right now um okay. and one thing I noticed is that sometimes the volume of your of your, of your callers is ve is very contrasting to the volume of you so like for so usually you are clear and at a good volume but it's really hard sometimes to hear other people uh, with it and when I have to increase the volume so much and the plosions sometimes are a little grating okay well we had a tech guy I mean our uh, producer listening to th he's hearing that probably unless he's out doing something in the office there but um, so uh, thank you for letting me know because I can't tell from this end because my, my end you sound fine but it, it has happened before that people have said they have trouble hearing the caller every now and then so mm. I don't what, you know so I don't know part Something of the th part, part part sorry <laughs> that's keep, right that's I'm right. sorry go ahead no you go you go ahead it's all right okay um so p part of the issue too is that people are because because you're at you probably have like um I think you have your you have like a headset I don't know if you have a boom mic or anything like that no, um it's a, you know but, it's a total unit but go yeah, but people are like sometimes calling on through their cars or through their phones and stuff. And so sometimes their mic quality is a little bad. And also they muffle some, they're, they, they're, they're like, um, they're, they're kind of muffled too. They'll, they'll talk sometimes really close to the mic or just won't speak right. up well. And so it makes it worse. Sometimes your voice is like eight times louder than them and like eight times clearer than them. And so I know you can't control that, but. I feel like the um, any plosions you can do on your end to like, reduce them, like I don't know if you have like pot filters and stuff, um, or if you can change the ratio. I feel like those things you should be you should be able to do to help the quality out. Yeah. Well, I have a, a headset with a mic attached to the headset, so it's two inches to my left, and I can tap it like that, and so the mm -hmm. puff sound isn't there. It has a uh, windscreen, you know, over it cap but uh so, but hey it's something and then the guy's listening the uh, producer is listening to this and he'll probably he'll probably uh, convey the information to people we'll see so it's what it is right now okay yeah but i appreciate it i appreciate it thank you for your ministry minute ministry matt hey man by god's grace thank you all right all right have a good okay. day bye you too good all right let's get to scott from utah scott welcome you're on the air Hi, how are you doing? Appreciate you taking my call. Hey, okay. uh, I was wondering what your opinion on how uh, biblical tithing is taught in most churches today. Uh, do you think it's still for today, 
or you think that was under the law and I, I, I feel giving is important. Obviously, there's bills to be paid and whatnot, but I, I really can't get it settled that it's still for today the way it's taught. I was just wanting your opinion on that. Yeah, it's not for today uh, the way it's taught in the Old Testament. That was a legal, a legal thing that you had to do, obligation to keep the law at 10%. You're not obligated to give 10% or 20 or 1%. You're not obligated to tithe. So what okay. the Bible talks about in the New Testament context is, is you freely give and support ministry because God's given this to you and you want to bless the expansion of the gospel. And that, that's what it comes down right. to. And so we're free. And so, uh, you know, my you wife think, and I sometimes don't go to church so. because of her health. And uh, so we, we kind of tithe differently by helping people out and doing things. And that's fine, too. Right. Do you think so many churches are just afraid to you know, not teach it, you know, like that. They they think their ministers won't get paid and whatnot. Because to me, it seems pretty clear how it is for the Old Testament and not for the New, but it just seems strange that it's such a coordinated effort to be taught the way it is. They use the same verses over and over again. And yep. What I say is, uh, it reminds me of George Mueller or something he said. I'll, I'll get to him in a second, but... If I were a pastor of a church, a pastor of a church again, I would I would just say, the tithe box is in the back, or the offering box. I wouldn't say tithe. I'd say offering box is in the back. Your uh, offerings and givings are between you and God. We're not interested in how much. Uh, I don't want to know. I'd say we have somebody on staff who, who does that, keeps records for receipts. I'm not interested in knowing anything. You know, uh, who does what? And if you give a lot, praise God. If you don't give any, praise God. That's between you and God. And that's it. Done. That's it. That's the kind of thing that I think needs to happen. Now, George Mueller was a guy in the 1800s. He died in, I think, 1898 or something like that. And uh, he was called the Orphan King. And he had orphanages. And he just relied on God. And one thing he said uh, when he was going to be a pastor before the orphanage thing started, he said that he would accept a pastorate position in a church under two conditions. And the first one was that uh, I think the first one was, was first make it one and two mixed up but at any rate one of them was that, that they had p paid pews that people who paid more money could sit up front and that was better stature and he said get rid of that and the second thing he said was that he would live only on the money that was tied and that no one was to know that that was the deal he would only live on it if God provided that was interesting Hey, we'll be right back. We've got a break. Hold on, man. We'll be right back after these messages. Please stay tuned. It's Matt Slick Live. Taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. Scott, welcome you back on the air. Scott, are you there? Yes, yes. I was just going to say I have, I've uh, been in several churches where I've heard Matthew twenty three twenty three used, mm -hmm. and to me, when you read that, it's clearly talking to the Pharisees and scribes who were under the law. Mm -hmm. But they say that's a testament in the new testament that it's still for today and I, I i can't get that any way shape or form it's not there see this is a theological point that many people miss so when jesus was doing the beatitudes he was talking to covenantal israel because jesus was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of israel matthew fifteen twenty four. he was not sent to the gentiles but because israel rejected the messiah then we the gentiles are grafted in this is the new covenant, but the new covenant isn't ratified until Jesus died. When he died, was resurrected, the new covenant's in effect. The new covenant, you see, technically, you know, check this out, uh, in the Gospels, up to the point of Jesus' resurrection, the, the stuff that's before in the Gospels technically is Old Testament. No, it's not Old Testament, right. it's New Testament, but it's of the Old Testament era. And people, oh, what? No, it is. It's not the New Testament era. Because when Jesus was born, it was still under the old law. 
it's not until the death of Christ and his resurrection associated there that the New Testament period comes in, which we mean by co the covenant abound. Because Old Testament is Latin for a testament is, uh, or a covenant is testamentum. Old covenant, new covenant. Old Testament, new testament. That's what's going on. And so the tithing stuff in the Gospels is Old Testament law. But in the New Testament, you don't find it after the New Testament covenant. In fact, you do find it in Hebrews, though, the word tithing, but it's talking about Old Testament stuff. So right. you're not obligated to, to tithe 10%. You're free to but, tithe 10% if you want, or more. I've, or I've also heard the, the, the uh, claim or the, the uh, uh, understanding that when people say, well, Abraham tithed, and that was before the law. Because he tied to Melchizedek. Yes, he did. But again, but I law, don't. I don't see the but, trans but, forward to, to the new covenant. But no, the, the law existed before um, uh, Abraham. Now, not the codified law, but the law did because there was still sin. Sin does not exist when there is no, or not imputed when there is no law. Uh, Romans five thirteen. Well, if, there was, if the law wasn't until. Uh, after Abraham until the time of Moses, then no one sinned. But that's not the case. The first actual mention of the law is uh, Genesis 2.17. Do not eat of the tree, because if you do, you're going to die. That's a law, because it has a punishment associated with it. Okay? Right. So there, it, this All is right. why theology is so important, because it, get, it clears things up like this. So I say to people, like I say, like like for now, this is a shameless plug, but I'll say, you know, CARM needs your support, and we do, okay? We really do need your support. It's the only way we can do this. I live off this off the donations of others. That's how I make a living. That's how I'm able to do everything I do, everything. And so I say to them, but first, support your church first, and then if you have anything else you want to give, then uh, please consider us. And that's how I believe it should be. And so... Um, but you're free to give a lot. You're free to give a little. It just depends. All right. Okay. All right. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome very much. All right. Well, God bless. All right. Now, let's get over to Jason from Arizona, then Bob from Lafayette after that, if you're still holding because it's been on a long time. Jason, you're on the air. Thank you, Matt. Um, in 1 John 5.13, we're told that believers in Christ um, currently possess eternal life. We have it now. It's in the present tense. Mm -hmm. So we know that the outward man, the physical body, perishes. So technically, I know you're an analytical, technical guy. We believers in Jesus, our soul and our spirit that continues on after death currently has everlasting life. Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. yep. Well, praise God. That's enough to rejoice for the rest of my life. <laughs> yep. Absolutely. And um, why do you have eternal life? Because of the grace of God and because he granted that you have faith, Philippians one twenty nine. that faith is in Christ, John six twenty nine. Therefore, you're justified by that faith, Romans 5, 1, without the works of the law, Romans 4, 5. And Jesus says, he gives eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. So Jesus equates eternal life with never perishing. And you go to John three sixteen, God's love the world, and gave his only begotten Son, whoever believed in him would never perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus equates eternal life with never perishing. And the reason we never perish is because of what Jesus did, not because of our goodness. Praise God. Right. So, Matt... Amen. um Technically, um, we have everlasting life, our soul and spirit, right. but the physical body is still subject um, to sin and death, right? Yep, that's correct. Okay, so technically speaking, forgive me if I sound a little arrogant, I'm not at your level, um, but the, so if, the, if our soul has everlasting life, then our soul is, is um, uh, sinless? No. Everlasting life does not mean you're sinless. It means that you're not going to face eternal judgment and condemnation in hell. Okay. So we know that we have sin, but because we're in Christ and Christ canceled the sin debt 
for the elect on the cross, Colossians 2.14, though we experience sin in real time, all of that sin was imputed to Christ uh, 2,000 years ago. And so all of it died with him, even the sins we commit today and tomorrow. And so it's called the now and the not yet. Okay, so um, so when you're out of the flesh, then your soul cannot sin? I'm just, know. I know I'm being technical. I'm just trying to understand. No, okay. no I, I, I don't say they can't, the soul can or cannot sin apart from the body because the Bible doesn't say it can or cannot. So, but if it's it, sinned, it, you die the second death, right? Not necessarily, because the, the second death is damnation in hell. That's not going to happen. Now, when I say, you know, as you said, I have to get more technical. So let's just say that we're, we die we, we're with the Lord before the resurrection. We're just in our, our spirit. All right. Can we sin? I don't know. There's only two possibilities. Yes and no. If it's yes... Does it mean we will, or does it mean we can but we won't? Because those are two possibilities within that. Just like a room full of light from every direction, there's no shadows that exist. But the objects that can cause the shadows are there, but no shadows exist because the light is so pre prevalent. Is the glory of God so prevalent upon us and in us that we just don't sin even though we have technically the capability? That's just a question. Or is it that the sinful nature abides somehow in the, in the physical flesh relationship that we have, separated from it, we just won't be able to sin anymore because we'll never desire to? That's another possibility. I just don't know which one is the correct one. Okay. Yeah, I know there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of, I just, I know sin causes death, so I'm just thinking logically, if the soul could sin, then we don't have eternal life because you can still die. So I'm thinking at some point we have to be totally sinless. We are sinless by... Okay. Jesus canceled the Sorry sin of the I'm... cross. No, 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 this is okay. In Colossians 2.14, it says, He canceled the certificate of debt consisting of decrees, which was hostile to us. He took it out of the way, having nailed to the cross. The certificate of debt, kerographon in the Greek, is the sin debt. If he canceled it for everybody who ever lived, no sin exists anymore for anybody. Everybody would have to go to heaven. This necessitates that Christ only legally bore the sin of the elect. But that, that would mean right. that the elect were the ones chosen by the Father in the Son, Ephesians 1, 4, before the foundation of the world. Okay, then that Amen. means... They, they, that's right. That means they cannot lose their salvation. Then what then about the sins okay. that we commit? The sins we go about daily committing... Uh, were all imputed to Christ 2,000 years ago. Well, any right. sin that we have committed or will commit has to be imputed to Christ. Potentially, I don't believe this is really possible, if we sin in heaven, that would have been imputed to Christ. Which I don't believe that we're going to sin in heaven, okay? I'm just saying, I'm just talking about logical possibilities, and then we knock one or two of the pins out and say, that's not going to work, here's why that's not going to work. So, because we awesome, have to Matt. apply more aspects of logic and... and uh, scripture to these other issues in order to lean a specific direction so personally i don't think we're going to be able to sin in heaven because we'll be in the presence of god and where he is we're not going to because he's just too great and pervasive thank you so much for your time matt i appreciate you okay brother god bless <laughs> we'll see you thank you all right sure yeah those are questions i've wrestled with for years folks and uh i don't have a great answer I wish I did. Um, but hey, if you have better in information, call me up and, and show me. No problem. Hey, we'll be right back after these messages with Bob from Lafayette, Lord willing. It's Matt Slick Live, taking your calls at 877-207-2276. Here's Matt Slick. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. If you want to give me a call, all you got to do is dial 877 877- Two zero seven two two seven six. Let's get on the air with Bob. Bob, welcome. You're on the air. Hey, Matt. This is Bob. I am in Louisiana. I've missed you on Clubhouse. I'm glad to see you're doing well. I've missed yeah, Joanne too. Yeah, I don't do Clubhouse anymore because my Club Deck unit uh, program won't work on my computer anymore, and I don't like the phone version <laughs> of it. It's too problematic for me. So I just haven't been on. 
Well, I've been working. I've been working it on the club deck, so uh, you might yeah, from, you might can reboot or try something else. But I don't know. I'm an but, uh, ex- ex- quest- tech. Okay, and I used to troubleshoot yeah, me them, too. rebuild them. I know the tricks, and I've done stuff I could explain you wouldn't even know, and I still can't get it to work. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I got you. But yeah. the question that I, I called about today, the, mm-hmm. the question that was being asked today, or that I asked, was Moses had said, you know, that God would raise up a prophet, you know, mm-hmm. that should be listened to adhered to and obeyed Mm -hmm. and i asked why are people trying to find out so much stuff from isaiah ezekiel and jeremiah when they could listen to what jesus said well you don't listen Uh, to what it just didn't that's a problem see you you talk like that but you don't listen to who he is you don't believe he's god in flesh you don't listen to him yeah god was in God was in Jesus. There's no doubt about that. Didn't, well, they didn't say that. Because, come on, God, Jesus is God in flesh. He has two natures, divine and human. It's not just God was in him like he's in me, like God indwells us. Okay. So God indwells you know, I've, I've me. You, I'm sorry, I've talked to you so many times and trying to get you to see. You're going to die in your sins if you uh, don't reject your false teaching. Let me ask you a question. Yeah, I'm uh, a Yes, sir. I've asked this, I've asked of, this of you before. Jesus says he and the Father will come and, li- and make their abode in us, the believers. He and the Father. God the Father can do this, and Jesus says he'll do it too. How is that possible if he's not God? John fourteen twenty three. How is that possible? Well, I looked at Revelation where it said Jesus would come, and later it said God himself would be with us. Those words okay. are in the book. But you didn't listen. Okay. When I ask difficult questions of you and to others, they do what you do. Just ignore the text and go to something else. Because you, you got to understand something. I ask you a question because I know where your problems are. You ignore it and you go someplace else, which means the question I have is a very big problem for you. You can't answer it, which shows you that your theological position is wrong. So you just ignore it. In other words, what you're doing is submitting the scripture to your preferences, not the other way around. You're an idolater. You're a false convert. You're not a true Christian. So let me ask you again. In light of what Jesus said in John 14, 23, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. How is it that Jesus says he and the Father will come and live in you? How is that possible if Jesus himself isn't God? It just doesn't, like I said, it just doesn't look to me like that's what he's saying. He but says, the Father we, will send Jesus. We will come to him and make our abode with him. We, that's the Father and Jesus. That's we. Yeah, that means Jesus and God should be on the earth with me and you, doesn't it? It says we will come to him and make our abode with him. Okay. Well, doesn't he do that, that mean that they would both be here with us on the earth? No man can see the Father. No, you can't see the Father because he dwells in unapproachable light who no man has seen or can see, First Timothy six sixteen. Okay? So that, that fails. I mean, Their interpretation there fails. So uh, to abode, his abode with us, is that's what it means. He lives with us, in us, by us. That's what it means. The Father's in us. How is Jesus going to do that too? Well, I, I don't know, but I thought Moses. Well, I not? thought God was with. I, but I do. I do believe Jesus is going to come, and God also will be on the earth with us at some time, okay. and He is abode, or He will be abiding with us. But okay. didn't, is Jesus didn't, the Christ? Is Jesus the Christ? Mm-hmm. Right, the Messiah. Yes, yeah, he's, he's the, the Christ, Messiah. Right? Ephesians three seventeen, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. How's he can, how can he do that? How can he dwell in your hearts? Everybody's hearts, all these thousands, thousands, millions and millions of people. How can Christ, that's Jesus, do that if he's not God? How can he do that? Ephesians 3, 17. Like, like, he's, and like he said, wait in Jerusalem till you're endued with power. The Holy Spirit will come and be in, in you. Does, does that's Jesus, how it happens. Does Jesus the Christ live in you, in your hearts? So what is that? Okay, does he? Does he? I have got the testimony 
of Jesus in my heart. But Jesus okay. is in heaven with my Father. Okay, is Jesus, it says, Christ, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So that means Christ can dwell in, in the believer's hearts. So is he in your heart? Yes. If no. The anointed, did, I am anointed. So yeah, he's got to be, Christ oh, would have so, to be in me, as Paul would say, yeah. Then, then how is Jesus able to live in multiple people's hearts at the same time if he's not God? He doesn't. He lives in heaven with God. And he's doing things in heaven. But the Bible says he dwells in our hearts. How can he be up in heaven with God and dwell in our hearts? Okay, Ephesians 3, By 17. the Spirit. You receive say, the, Spirit. the Spirit. Don't change the word of it's God. It's got it to be by the Spirit. It doesn't say that. It says Christ may Can't dwell in any... your hearts. That's what it says. So is it's Jesus doing that? It's got to be by that? the Spirit, though. It doesn't say that by the Spirit. The Spirit. See? Yeah, it's got to be by the Spirit. It doesn't say that. How can it be any other way? A, a man can't dwell in my heart. So Second Corinthians thirteen five: Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourself that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? That applies to you. See, you deny that Jesus Christ can live in you. Okay. By the Spirit, the Christ Second, is in me. That's not what it says. Jesus says Jesus is in. Second Corinthians thirteen five. That's what it is. It says the same Spirit 17, that Second raised Jesus. 13, 5. Look, the same Spirit look, that we've raised had, Jesus from the dead. Jesus raised Himself from the dead. Uh, John two nineteen through twenty one. Destroy this temple three days. Well, I will raise it up. Future active indicative. Uh, but, yeah, like you said, it's been debated a while. But anyway, I'm no, glad to hear no, you're well. No, and, uh, no, this is it's debated among the Christians and the non-Christians, the true believers and the heretics. The Bible says what it says, and you deny what it says. And I have to be strong with I you. I don't deny. You. Yes, you do. I don't deny anything deny. Jesus said. Yes, did Jesus, he said, destroy this temple three days, I will raise it up. Talk about his own body. John two nineteen through twenty one, did Jesus raise his own body up? According to Peter, he did. Okay, I said, did Jesus raise his own body up? I quoted what Jesus says: destroy this temple three days. No, God, I will I, I, raise it up. Did Jesus raise up God, his own body? Did he do it? No, I think God. I don't think okay. Jesus did it. I think God did it. Okay, so see, you continue to deny who Christ is. We're going to move along because we've got a few minutes left. This show. Okay. We'll more call Thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, I'll you're, you're catch lost, you buddy. later. Okay. All right. That's Bob. I had many conversations with him. I know his M.O. And uh, he's not a Christian. Clarice. Welcome, Clarice. You're on the air. Hi, Matt. Um, Hi. My question before I get to my question is, those kind of people that you just got off the phone with, Mm-hmm. I mean, I've heard this this guy call before. I don't know why he calls you, because he's not going to... Ch I mean, he's, his rationalization is... He is lost. I mean, his eyes are blind. Uh, his mind is blinded. I understand that. But I just wondered why you carry on knowing that they're, they're blind. So that people can hear what the truth is and here be defended and learn what verses are useful so that they can benefit. But I think it just it went over this guy's head. I've heard but him before. On over, your, listen, it's... But it, it didn't go over other people's heads. People might be on the fence oh, not true, understanding true, something. True. Right. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. I understand what you're saying there. Okay, my question to you is... <clears throat> mm -hmm. How do you approach someone, and I know it's all, if God's working in a person's heart, I'm talking about a sinner. Um, how do you know when you're supposed to witness and talk to someone about their salvation and their soul? I'm not talking about on your radio program. I'm just talking about your everyday life. And when people, maybe arises. you have lost friends. Sir? When the opportunity arises. So, do you start the conversation, or 
do you just Sometimes. how do you <laughs> today okay. I went to Costco you're being very choppy with me and you gave this 25 <laughs> minute dialogue with this other person so well the, your questions are different okay and yours is a good question so so today I went to Costco and I went out to check out line a guy had a cross on who worked there and I said hey I like a cross are you a Christian started a conversation Sometimes I say, no, I'm not a Christian. I say, oh, why are you wearing that? And I, you know, I might talk to them. I might mm-hmm. have a cross on myself. Uh, you know, my last name is Slick, and so I use it. You know, I'd say, yeah, that's right. My last name's Slick. I'll show them a card. They'll pay something. I say, you can't trust a guy named Slick, you know, and they'll chuckle. And I say, and I'm a reverend also. And it's just another opportunity. So I'm, I try and generate opportunities. But, you know, the thing that mm-hmm. I tell, tell people is just, just give it a try. Just look for opportunities. Ask God to to open your heart and mind and, and theirs too and take a risk and give it a try. That's all. You know? Well, I, you know, I wrestle with the fact that the verse in Matthew that says, don't give holy things to dogs. And, you know, I, you know who am I to say the person's a dog? But, you know, I, I know I have discernment enough to know that I'm not going to try to share the gospel with somebody that's cursing and, you know, maybe you, not, maybe you they're not open for it. You don't know. You just, you just don't know. I remember once that I was at a gas station in San Diego getting gas and a stoplight was right next to the gas station and a guy pulled up to the left lane and he's got his blaring uh, rap music that's all foul and just at 80 decibels. It's just blaring all over mm-hmm. everywhere. And I ran out into mm-hmm. the street and I knocked on his door. I scared a crud out of him. I said, what do you listen to that crap for? You need the Lord Jesus. You need, because, you know, he'll got a few seconds before the light changes. You need to repent of that stuff, that foul stuff's getting in your heart and your mind. You need Christ Jesus as your Savior. You need to repent. And I just, the light turned. Go. What did he and do? He, he was shocked. And I, I pointed out that the light just changed. So you got to go. And I ran back across to get my, my gas and finish it. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you never know. That's some Holy Ghost boldness right there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Um, well, I, you know, for me, and I've been thinking about it a lot because I, I have a heart. My, 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 my heart is for lost souls and also for prayer. Right, I have right. a prayer meeting in my home once a month. Can you oh, well. call back tomorrow? Let's talk about this. When you don't have, when we have more time, okay? Call back to the beginning of the show. We can talk. Uh, okay, it's, I will. It's a, on Monday. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Well, God bless. All right. Hey, folks, sorry, we're out of time. I'd love to have, would have loved to talk to her some more. Can't. Hey, God bless. We'll see ya. Another program powered by the Truth Network. <laughs>